Greetings, everyone, this morning. What a beautiful day it is to worship the Lord in Ypsilanti, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church as we gather this breezy morning in March. Let us be in the house of the Lord. So I say unto you, peace be with you. Also with you. Let us be glad to be here this morning and rejoice. Amen.
Are you thirsty for grace? Are you hungry for mercy? God is calling. Come to the waters. For God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to serve and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained, and great when we are small. We have failed in love and neglected justice and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to the path of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So listen. Listen so that you may live. The steadfast love of the Lord never fails. Amen. Let us offer a prayer before our reading this morning. For Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may enter and hear with joy what you say to us this day. The first reading is from Psalm 32, a psalm pleading for the intervention of God. For happy are those, blessed are those, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy, blessed are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For while I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. 
Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve for me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Jesus gives us the lesson of forgiveness today, of the place of God being observant and watchful, of us being steadfast at his side, and for those who have strayed to come home. Here we turn now to the wonderful story of the prodigal son in the 15th chapter of Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners coming near to Jesus listened to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were scrumbling, grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them a parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anyone, anything. But then he came to himself, and he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son, remember he had two sons. His elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants over and asked him what was going on. He replied, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has gotten him back safe and sound. And then the elder son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and pled with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The sermon today is, what about me? It's a perspective of the elder son as he responds to the accusations against him. Received a letter from him. This is his words. He begins to say, to all concerned for justice, greetings. Year after year, preachers great and small have, in a hundred languages, led you from the pit of my younger brother's self-imposed exile to the sounds of dancing and leave you staring at me, disgusted because I will not share the celebration for the prodigal's return. It's time you took a minute or two to hear my side of the story, what it's like to be an elder brother and why I reacted the way I did. I should, I suppose, enlist an aid of the panel of experts to be witnesses here today. My brother has, after all, turned his case over to the worthy clergy who have so embroidered their bias in his favor that I can never hope to balance the facts by myself. In fact, there's a book on that clergyman's shelf that says, is all forgiven? Really? It occurs to me, however, that many of the people of the world are themselves older brothers or older sisters, and that our common status will facilitate a larger understanding. So I make my own defense in a hope that a simple, honest statement is all that is needed. I cannot deny that one unlovely moment of my life. I had come in from the fields in the evening and has been reported. And I heard the sound of dancing and smelled the roasting meat, and I was surprised. So I asked the servant what was going on. I cannot deny the jealousy and hurt that arose within me when I learned that it was a party for my wayward brother. I make no defense for my behavior. I cannot even say that I would behave differently should the story repeat itself. But I want you to understand that I will regret it for the rest of my life. I hate the feeling in myself. I know that jealousy is the worst of me. Now, without in any way defending my reaction, I do want to say what it's like to be an elder brother. I hope you understand. I need your understanding. Let me say, first of all, that being an elder brother has something to do with being responsible. I'm not referring to chronological age, but about an elder brother, well, elder brother syndrome that can occur in the life of anyone. And the most significant element in elder brother syndrome is a sense of responsibility. Even the youngest may bear this burden, but I think the elder bears it particularly. You see, I was responsible for a large farm. We had servants, of course, lots of them. But there is a difference, it seems to me, about being a servant and being an owner. Servants usually take orders, but owners are the ones who take responsibility. We are the ones who must decide when the fields are ready to plow and plant. We select the seed. Owners decide how many sheep the land can support. We decide when to shear the sheep. And since there will inevitably be bad years when the crops fail and too many of the sheep die, it is our responsibility to see that enough money and food has been set aside so the farm can continue and the servants be fed. Think I had no moments, even days or weeks or months, when I wanted to leave it all? That I have no hunger for wine, women, and song? Do you think I was born a drudge? No, I was born an elder brother, son of aging parents who looked to me to share the responsibility of being an owner from the day I was born, I was reared to be accountable, as though my parents, servants, and all the generations to follow were dependent upon me. I was raised to be responsible. I say it with only a touch of pride, certainly not with regret. I say it only in hope that you might understand. There are those who come to a party, 
and there are those who work to prepare for that party, who see to it that the house is clean, that there's enough wine, that the fire pit is well stocked with wood, that the musicians are ready. There are those who go home from the party singing their happy songs, and there are those, those of us who clean up, clean up after them, who sweep the cracker crumbs and the bits of smoked fish from the floor, wipe the white circles left by the mugs on the polished wood. There are those who come as guests and go home carefree. And there are those who prepare for the party and clean up when the revelry is over. I'm one of the latter. Usually I'm not unhappy about this, nor am I proud of it either. It's one of the roles in the human family, one of the chores I take on and I play it well. I am marked with elder brother syndrome, I'm told. I'm okay with that. Let me also say that elder brothers, I have learned, are perhaps harder to love. I wonder sometimes why people find it so easy to love people like my younger brother. Notice that now I call him my brother. It was only in that awful moment of jealousy when the worst of me came out and I called him my father's younger son. His offenses were so clear. He had wasted money that had come from generations of work on the farm. He lived with harlots. He came home with nothing. Why is it so easy to accept the wayward? Perhaps they are so vulnerable that it's easy to accept them. They're so obviously in trouble that they pose no threat. Perhaps it's easiest to love people who are so vulnerable. I have been pictured as self-righteous. Yes, I've heard it. The hardest of all to love. I know that. But look into your own hearts, you elder brothers and elder sisters. Those of you who like me are responsible. Let us confess that we are sinners too. I work with the servants of the field, and as the sun grows unbearably hot, my anger rises, and I find myself beating the ground so hard that the hoe I have in my hand, well, the handle breaks. The other day, a goat kicked over a pail of milk again, and in anger, well, I kick the goat. You laugh, perhaps, but it is the nature of elder brothers and sisters to carry their anger to carry their sins hidden within their hearts. What did you expect? Should I go home and say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I broke another hoe and I kicked the goat. No, elder brothers and sisters are the responsible kind. And our sins are not obvious, nor easily shared. Therefore, we are harder to love. I do want to acknowledge that being responsible has its award rewards. I do understand that my father was right when he said, You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. I know that. I, I really do. My satisfaction, the reward for my being responsible is to look out over the field. There it is sprouting green this spring and to take in the beauty of it and in the harvest to gather in the sheaves, exulting in the weight of sacks of grain filled from the threshing floor. My reward is that of a job well done, a household running smoothly with people fed and provision against times of famine and my taxes all paid. My satisfaction is the respect of my neighbors and those around me, being able to give to those in need. I'm blessed to be in the company of my father and to know his blessing. I'm a gold watch person. Sisters and we elder brothers, we are the 99 who take care of ourselves, the ones whom the shepherd can leave to go look for the rest. As you can tell, I write these words easily. 
I know what our rewards are coming quietly every day of our lives. But it's so hard to see that no good son of my father, oh, excuse me, it's so hard to see my younger brother come home empty-handed and receive the ring and the robe, the shoes, to smell the roasting meat and hear the music of his dancing. Yes, he is contrite of heart. I do believe that. He suffered. But, ah, the anger, it's not all gone, is it? I understand it with my mind, and I know how to say it with words, that elder brothers are responsible and sinners just like everyone else, harder to love, whose rewards come quietly day by day, gold watch people. I understand that. It's harder to make my emotions behave. I guess my heart hasn't quite caught up to my head. Well, that's my side of the story, but I want to leave you with a question. How shall we be saved, we elder brothers and elder sisters? How can we go home when we are already home? How can we confess the squandering of resources, the months and years of neglect, the desperation, when in fact we have built and not squandered, not gone out with the wayward, been responsible for preserving the family fortune. How shall we be helped, those of us with our secret anger and the harlotry that stays in our hearts, those of us who are hard to love because we show so little need, who show only on rare occasions the jealousy that made us turn away from the dancing to become forever the ill-reputed elder brother. How shall we be saved? Well, I'll tell you what I think. And you may have some insight too. It would probably help if we shared with others some of the responsibilities that make our lives such a burden. Do we have to be owners in the sense that we make all the decisions? Wouldn't it make for a less lonely and isolated life if we invited our servants to be partners in the productive process? Teachers and students could become collaborators in the process of gaining and sharing knowledge. Managers and those who now manage can become partners in a common enterprise. Children could share more of the responsibilities for creating a family. And by that, I mean that children could help make decisions and not simply to respond to demands. Do we not, by the very way we live, the way we structure our relationships, create the burdens that we chafe under, the anger that arises within us? To become less owner-like, to enter into partnerships and be collaborators that just might be part of our salvation. I suppose this could be said in a less pompous way. It has probably not escaped your attention that, well, self-importance is one of the more obvious manifestations, signs of elder brother syndrome. You remember that, among other things, that I said to my father, you never gave me a kid. I might make merry with my friends. Well, the truth of the matter is, I never thought to ask. I never thought to ask my father if I could have a party. I wonder about that. It didn't seem appropriate. There was always so much to do, not just with hands. That's the easy part. So there's so much thinking to be done, so many problems to be solved. Thinking and problem solving, well, they don't really mix with parties. Actually, I was think I was concerned about the appearance of things, really. What would the servants and neighbors look up to a person, depend upon a person who throws a party? By assuming authority and by refusing to share it, I have set myself apart, and now I realize I have isolated myself. Isn't there some other model for elder brothers? That's my question. A large sharing of responsibility could well be part of that answer. 
A part of our salvation could be a further recognition of the gifts that come to us, the gifts that come to us day by day as a consequence of being responsible, the fruit of it, really. If we could see more often the greening fields that we have planted and delight in the blessings from God, if we could see our growing children fed and clothed and rejoice in our partnership with them and with God, if we could rejoice to feed the hungry, to set some tangled person free and not be stingy in welcoming them home, then we would probably find in these things a quiet joy in which both our reward and a replacement for our anger. This would be a sign of our salvation. My father said it well, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. This other part of our salvation must be the same as that experienced by our younger brothers and sisters. Our sins are not loud like theirs. In many ways, they're quiet and private, but no less damaging. In fact, our hidden anger may be more damaging than their more flagrant sins, at least to those around us. In some ways, it'd be easier to repent for what is obvious, the extravagant sins of the far country, than to speak of the pain of our jealousy and self-righteousness, the hidden anger and dark fantasies that come as we pursue our more ordered lives. God knows these hidden sins too, of course. Erect we stand as solid citizens before the cross, but our hearts are bowed. He embraces us with his eyes not just those who are bent with weeping. There may be no churning spit, no music for dancing. We elder brothers are not the best dancers anyway. But we go down the hill from Golgotha knowing that he died for us too. We go down to our green valley to see the field of sprouting seed, knowing that all that he has is ours and we are his. So, O oh God, creator, of the elder brothers and sisters of the world. Have mercy on us. O oh God, redeemer of those unmasked by a moment of jealousy, have mercy upon us. O oh God, sustainer of those who receive gold watches, grant us your peace. Amen. So let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
the giving of these gifts be used for the upbuilding of your way in our community, O gracious Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Before I begin with pastoral prayers today, I turn to a few announcements. First is the One Great Hour sharing envelopes that were available that support people in need throughout the world of refugee relief and local needs of food and hunger. Also, we'll have a little cleaning bee in just a week from Wednesday on April 6th in the morning, 10 to 12.30, to spruce up the church, mostly light cleaning, dusting, and vacuuming. The Lenten study continues on Wednesday. It's been well attended, and I'm thankful for that, and we've been taking delight in learning more about the Old Testament's connection to the New Testament. Well, let us be in God's home, so let us be a people of prayer. For Jesus, remember us when you come into your kingdom. For your church around the world, we ask for new life. For all who carry out ministries in your church, we ask for grace and wisdom. During the season of Lent, of being watchful, for those who have accepted spiritual disciplines, we ask for inspired discipleship. For Christians in every land, we ask new unity in your name. For Jews and Muslims and people of other faiths, we ask your divine blessing. For those who cannot believe, we ask for your faithful love. For our president and governors and rulers in every land, we ask for your guidance. For people who suffer in sorrow, we ask your healing peace. We particularly pray for the refugees from the war in Ukraine, in Somalia, in Syria, May they find a place to lay their head, a cup of cool water, warm clothes, and a bed for rest. Protect the children and those who are frail. Gracious Lord, the world seems torn asunder once more. Help us be steadfast for justice. Help us protect the innocent. Help us fight the good fight. Help us to follow in your way when it seems all so confusing in the fog and the mist and the smoke. Protect our men and women in armed services and in governmental agencies and non-governmental agencies of aid who go to troubled places at risk of life. Help them know of the good work they do, those who are so responsible. Help them enjoy the fruit of their work. Help all who are elder and brother, elder brothers and sisters who take on too much, to know that your burden is light and your yoke is easy, that you are watchful. Help us be a people of gratitude, that we can appreciate what we have been given and what we have and can see and be, and therefore our hearts be glad. We pray this day for those who are nearer to your kingdom, gracious Lord, who are wading through the Jordan to meet you, for George Moore in hospice with cancer. We pray for his children, Amanda and Brandon, for his extended family, for his mother, Teresa, 
his ex-wife Gwen, and Greg Work. Give them peace. Gracious Lord, we pray for Mary Ray Green in hospice. Thank you for the clarity of mind that she has in her rejoicing in your name and in your holy presence. Guide her as indeed you have and continue to do so until she comes home to a rest with you and meets you and sees you face to face in that holy embrace. I pray for others who are ill these days, who look for recovery and strength to fight the good fight, for Bob Taylor and Louise Woodruff, for Jennifer Renault, for Nancy Spencer, for Ed and Monty Grubaugh, for others we name in our hearts who are upon our minds. We pray for all those who yearn to return home that they may find an embrace. May those who have remained and taken care of things that they too can rejoice and celebrate reunion. For such is your way, gracious Lord, that all shall be reconciled unto you. God of love, as in Jesus Christ you gave, ourselves, you gave yourself to us, so may we give ourselves to you, living according to your holy will, keep our feet firmly in the way where Christ leads, make our mouths speak the truth that Christ teaches, fill our bodies with the life that is Christ within us. In his holy name we pray as his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we end today with a good word, let me also share that for those that would like to gather and offer prayers for Ukraine, we'll be gathering in the parlor just behind the sanctuary immediately following worship. But on this day, I often, as we do each Sunday, let us remember who we are and who has called us and who sends us forth. For we go nowhere by accident, wherever we go. God is sending us. Wherever we are. God has put us there. For God has a purpose in our being there, and Christ who dwells in us has something he wants to do through us, where we are right now. So go forth with the love of God in your heart, the grace of Jesus Christ upon you, 
and the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Amen.